Sound like that. Beautiful. Thank you. Today we're going to read from the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, uh, and this is the lectionary text for the day, which means it's part of those four readings that many people around the world are reading today in worship services, and so you can hear these same words in many languages if you listen hard enough, but I want you to listen for the Word of God in a fresh new way this morning as I read. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in a large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which were worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has, given, has put in everything she has, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So this morning, we're, uh, we're going to do a couple of sermons that are just on their own, and then on December the 2nd, we're going to start a worship series that's called the Nutcracker, and it's, the lessons are actually going to come from that uh, great piece of, uh, I guess it's a ballet. Is that a ballet? Yeah, a ballet. Uh, but also great pieces of music that you know well. Uh, and uh, it, it's an interesting uh, thing. And next week I'm going to have some actual invitations that you're going to have in your hands that you can hand to somebody else and invite them to come and be a part of this Advent uh, worship series uh, here at First Methodist. But today we're looking at this passage in Mark, and as I read and did some studying and thinking about what I would talk about, I was reminded that I really kind of enjoy people watching. And what I really know is, so do you. <laughs> you actually enjoy people watching. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I like to look at people in different situations, and Y'all know that for many years I was in retail, and almost all of the years I was in retail, I had some connection with the shoe business, okay? And we would be in airports, and I'd be looking at people's feet, and my wife would look at me strangely, and I'd say, I'm just checking out what's going on with the shoes. <laughs> and, you know, I would imagine some of the other people in the airport thought that was strange, but, you know, it's a great place to see a variety of what people are actually wearing, and that's one way of people watching. But I'll tell you that really like two weeks after I came here, we went to Austin for a training that Marianne was doing, and I had the whole day free to, you know, make my way around Austin. And I ended up at a little place called the, Co it was called Cosmic, Ca uh, Cosmic Coffee. And I got to tell you, Cosmic Coffee puts itself way up here on the ability to people watch. Um, <laughs> I know that some of you know that Austin has claims that it might be a little weird from time to time. <laughs> and um, Cosmic Coffee fits right into that category. And, but it was a really interesting thing. Uh, you went into a, a little building and, and got your coffee. And then, you know, there may have been like three tables for two people inside the place. But then they had this whole big outdoor area that had um, like organic gardens and all this other kind of stuff. And there were people there with their children and their dogs. They had a whole stack of dog bowls right next to the hose that, you know, they were there to, to make sure the dogs had plenty of water. There were old hippies there. Uh, there were, you know, everybody you can think of from, uh, you know, almost any kind of walk of life. And, of course, I was by myself because so, she was in training, and I, I just sat there for a long time. First time I had a, an iced coffee, and it was good, and I sat there and watched 
the people. And I will tell you, that was really some of the best people watching I've ever gotten in. Um, but I'll tell you that you, you guys, I know you guys people watch too. Because here's what I, I, I've seen before, and that is when, particularly when we do communion, you watch as people go by. And you see what they're wearing, what they're doing. And trust me, I know. I get, the, you know. I get the advantage. I can see all of you. Not only them at the altar who may be you know, having moments with their family and showing love with one another or whatever, you know, smiling or you know, serious looks on their face, uh, and all of which are appropriate at communion. But I see you watch. So I, I know that you also participate in, in this people-watching thing. And the story today is really sort of about people watching, at least to a certain degree. And in this particular story, let me set the, the place a little bit. It's in the temple in Jerusalem, and Jesus has been there. Some translations say teaching. Others say he was in conversations with the scribes and Pharisees. I like to take it that he's, you know, arguing with the big shots of the church about something that was going on. And he gets tired, and he decides to sit down. Now, I will tell you always when this, this is the gospel according to Curtis and the rest of this story is. So I picture him finding a bench on the side of the temple across from the treasury and watching, people watching, the people who are going to come in and put money in the treasury. Now, my research tells me that in all actuality, there were 13 boxes, sort of looked like suitcases except they were metal, that people could put money in, and there was one for the pastor's salary, and one for the widows and the orphans, and one for the trustees to take care of the temple. And, and this was a fabulous temple. They say it was 150 feet high, gorgeous. This was Herod's temple, Herod the Great, and one of the reasons he was great, because he built great things. This was his temple. That would have been the temple of the time of Jesus. And he was watching. People put money in there, right? And um, as he did... I like to picture when he came in. Y'all know him, don't you? He drove the finest camel. He rode the finest camel to church and parked at the very front of the camel parking lot. And he came in with his fine purple robes on. He probably had a cummerbund. He had some wrap on his head. I mean, he was a dandy. <laughs> he was something, right? And as he walked in, people watched, and that's exactly what he wanted wanted people to watch, and he had a checkbook, and he very ceremoniously wrote out a check, and he signed it, and he very ceremoniously rips the check out of his checkbook and puts it in the plate, and everybody says, oh, thank God, the temple's going to make it because this guy gave his big donation, right? And Jesus watched that, and then a very unassuming widow woman, probably dressed in not-so-fancy stuff, probably, you know, grays and drab colors, maybe. I, you know, it's kind of the way I picture. Nobody pays attention to her. Nobody really sees her. And she walks up, and I picture it's the same one of those 13 boxes that she drops two pennies in, or two copper coins. Some translations say less than a penny. Some say it was a penny. Any way you look at it, it was not much money. And here's what I picture, that Jesus sitting there kind of motioned his disciples over and whispered in their ears, look at what she's doing. She has given everything she has. Everything. And then he says, of all the people, she's given more than any of them because all of the rest of them have given out of their abundance and she has given out of her poverty everything that she has. Now, I want to take this different than just money. Obviously, this is a story about money, isn't it? But I think it's more than just money. I think it's how we are in relationship with God and how we give of ourselves. And when they saw her, Jesus said, pay attention to that one. Maybe because nobody else was, but maybe just because he understood. And she puts her money in, 
and probably very assume, unassumably walks back and does her thing. And you know her name, right? Oh, no, you don't. You don't know her name because Scripture doesn't record it. Now, we know Zacchaeus, and we know Barnabas, and we know some other folks in the Scripture, but we don't know her name. We don't because they didn't record it. Mark doesn't record it. And I think there may be several reasons for that. I've told you all before, Mark's my favorite gospel because Mark is move, move, move. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Tomorrow, the next day, when we were finished this, with this, we moved on to this. And maybe he was just too busy to think about it. But I have another explanation. And again, I'm going to warn you, this is the gospel according to Curtis. And that is that I think sometimes that the gospel people, writers, you know, the ones that have survived to our time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they sometimes don't tell you a name because they want you to understand what the person did and be able to place yourself into the story in place of them. Do you get that? They want to be able to say, you look at Kathy, you know, uh, you look at uh, Wesley, you look at whoever, and, and you'll see somebody who's giving it their all. Okay? Y'all understand that part of it? I mean, I think it's a possibility. Again, take it for what you will. That's one of the reasons I think that we don't know her name. But I'm going to do something maybe that's not real smart, and I'm going to give her a name, and I'm going to call her Hannah. I don't know why. It's just a name. Don't go out from here and say the guy that Curtis said the, the lady's name was Hannah. I'm just telling you, I just want to put a name to her this morning. And, and so we name her. And when I gave this title for this sermon to Christy to put in the bulletin, I see, you see it says, Hannah and the 2%. And you know what she immediately did. How many of you are Aggies? Nobody in here is Aggies? Oh, my goodness. Oh, okay, they're all back here. All right. So when I told her 2%, what did she say? Whoop right? And y'all, do y'all know about two percenters at a and I know your pastor before you certainly shared some A&M uh, lore with you, right? I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and a two percenter is, their belief is that 98% of the people there are fanatics, right? I would like to call them brainwashed, but <laughs> they would like to call themselves fanatics. And they're, they say 98% of them buy into all of the Aggie stuff and only 2% of the people don't, okay? I get that, and I actually respect that. My dad and my brother both went to A&M, and I respect the fact that they have a lot of loyalty to their schools, and that's a good thing, all right? But the 2% in here comes from a little different place. About, uh, it was either a week or two weeks ago, I got one of the things that I get from the Methodist Church, and it was talking about giving, and in this article... Uh, the folks that were writing it were said and stated that historically people throughout time and it holds true in the church today that people throughout time have historically given 2% of their income to charity and that's all charity that's not just the church that 2% of the general population's income goes to charity that's everybody all right So you know that God has called us to something different, right? In the Old Testament, he called them to give the first 10%. And you know that many of the things that he did, of his things that he required of the people of the Israel, nation of Israel, was so that they could be set apart and that they could be different than the rest of the people. And so I look at this and think, well, if the rest of the world's given 2% and the people who love God are given 10%, that calls them out, makes them different, does it not? All right, and so, uh, you know, I think that's probably part of it. But as I think about that, and this story went on to say that that holds true. If you take all the, the people who are actively attending a Methodist church and took the total income of everybody there and, and got to up a percentage that typically Methodists give about 2% of their income to charity, not to the church, to charity. And, you know, we could focus on that, 
But that's not really what I want to do today, and I don't really even want to focus on money necessarily. It's obviously a part of this story. But what I would really rather us, us to do is in, instead fix our vision on Hannah. Remember my name, Hannah, all right? I want you to think about Hannah and what makes her different than the average. So if you really, if you really think about this, probably the truth was of all those other people that Jesus watched put into the treasury, you could add them all up and they probably gave 2% of whatever it was they were given because that's the history of the world that we've been doing that. But she, it says, gave all that she had. Now, I'm not a proponent of giving everything you have so that you can't take care of yourself and your family. That's not the purpose of that story or this talk this morning. But it is an important part, I think, of how we are in relationship with God. And, and so, uh, I want to look at a little bit about the qualities that I would say Hannah has that allows her to make the kind of decision that she makes on that day, all right? Now, remember, I, I'm not telling you to give all you, you have. That, you know, that would be silly, and don't ever think about that. I mean, John Wesley, our founder, said, give all you can, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And if you really read it closely, it's make all you can and save all you can so you can give all you can, all right? But uh, in, in, in this case, I think we're talking about a lifestyle and a life dedication that way out, uh, you know, is way outside the realm of just our financial giving. So let's take a look a little bit at Hannah. And first of all, I think what makes her such a generous person is that she knows the Lord. Now, how can I say that this is, I mean, again, this is not scripture, right? But how can I say that what I think about this woman? Well, it turns out, um, I've been hanging around church people for a long time. Um, you know, I've not been a minister for a terribly long time, but I, I, I was a, family, a, a part of a family who was in church every Sunday. I think we would maybe take two Sundays off a year. Uh, you know, if we would pry my dad away and, and really convince him that we could take a week off and go to Galveston or somewhere. But I was in church every Sunday, and when, when we got married, we were regular Members, I mean, and, and active in churches. And guess what? I've been around a lot of church people. And I've been on almost every church committee you can imagine, district-wide, conference-wide. I've been around a lot of church people. And these are the things that I have learned from generous church people that I'm now going to apply to Hannah because I believe they had to be true of her. All right? And the first is, is that she knew the Lord. Now, what would that have meant to her? Well, it would have been to know God, right? Yahweh, the one who had delivered the nation out of Israel, the one who had allowed them to get to this point, and the one who had uh, brought the nation to a point where Herod builds this fabulous temple and now has uh, produced Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But she wasn't, a, uh, you know, pledging allegiance to Jesus. This wouldn't have been Jesus, Lord. This would have been God, right? Would have been our Creator, the creator of the universe, the very people are the very person in the form of God that we know to be God, all right? And she would have had uh, a relationship based on what I see from people that give is they have a daily prayer life, and they have a daily cleansing. They have a, a daily walk with God. They, they know the Lord. They know what it's like to be in relation. And I will tell you, this daily cleansing thing, the reason I can actually probably be pretty definite about that was she was a regular at the temple. And when they did that, one of the first things they had to do is go past what was called the laver. And that was a place where, guess what? You physically washed. It, it speaks to those things in our faith that we know about water. And we know that the waters of baptism are the places where we are washed of our sin and we come and are, are, are made right with Christ and God and are accepted as children into the church. So we understand that cleansing, right? She would have done that on a daily basis. I recommend somehow you cleanse every morning, meaning you get right with God. I actually say a prayer of confession every morning, very similar to the one that you say typically when we do communion. 
you look, I know that I've not loved my neighbor like I should have. I know I have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive me and let me start this day off better. It's a daily thing. You get that? It's one of the things I know about people who give. They have a relation with God. The second thing is that the reason that she was so generous was that she understood, even in her poverty, the generosity of God. What I have seen about people who give is that they first and foremost understand about that particular characteristic of God. That God is a generous God and every gift that we have comes from God and no matter what, even if, and, and I've seen people who give who could barely rub two pennies together and yet they gave. They gave both monetarily and of themselves and of their lives and of their love. And I've seen people who make tons of money who do the exact same thing. I had a very close friend who was a owner of a very successful business who made a lots of money. But I will tell you that he, he still was in the same place of this woman in that he understood that everything he had came from God and that everything is always a generous gift from God to us. And that's not just money either. It's our health. It's all those things that go along with that. Uh, it's all of who we are as people and, and as Christians. And Hannah had that same feeling. I have to believe it, that she believed that everything came from God. Her good fortune, her health, her, uh, you know, our, our brains, our work habits, everything else that brings to us who we are and what we, how we relate to God. The third reason that I think Hannah was so generous was is that she was a mature person. What I have seen is mature Christians are also giving Christians. It's been my experience in, in that. And what do I mean by that? I mean, first off, she just wasn't a beginner. You know, one of the real struggles that, that our denomination has had is that some of us sit inside congregations and say, well, we get all these people in, but they don't give anything. And then we st we're not any better off financially when, than we were. Well, guess what, my friends? That may be God's plan because that's the way it works. Beginners don't do that. But the truth is that when they're here, we should immediately be making them more mature. We should be making disciples of Jesus Christ out of them to where they get to the place where someone like Hannah is who understands the generosity of God, who understands that they need to be in love with the Lord, and that then they will come to the same conclusions that our best givers have ever come to. And they will give just like they have, you know, just like you have, and supported our church. And I have personally noticed again and again that it's mature people, mature Christians, who are generous givers. And by that, I mean they walk, they talk, they, they know their Bibles, they come to this front, and when they receive the sacraments, they are deeply moved by the fact that they are taking in the body and blood of Christ, that they know for a fact that the way we understand it as, as Methodist is that there is a mysterious presence of Jesus Christ, and in that mysterious presence, their lives are changed, and they can go out and change the world. And they're generous people. And then finally, I would tell you that I think that Hannah knows that she will have more than enough. Now, that's a tough, tough story. Because i got to tell you, again, I've seen people who don't know where the next month's rent's going to come from, don't know where their next, you know, meal really is coming from. But some of them know that if they continue to be faithful to God and if they continue to give 100% like this woman did of their life to God, not necessarily their money, but probably their money too, that somehow things are going to work. And I'm going to tell you a story about a man that I knew when I was young. Uh, he was about 20 years older than I was, and we were having a conversation similar to this about our financial giving at a church and how, you know, how we get to that place. And he told me the story that his family was what they call dirt poor. <laughs> Y'all know that expression, right? You're from the same neighborhoods of, that I came from. Y'all know what dirt poor is. And uh, that's 
his term. He said they were dirt poor, and his dad was killed in an accident when he was nine years old. And he literally, and his family, and his siblings, and his mother didn't know how they were going to eat the next day. He was killed in an accident where they didn't get some big settlement, you know, and he was gone, the, the sole breadwinner. And he said, the next day, a woman from the church showed up with a basket of food. He said, I became a tither that day. I didn't have anything to tithe on, but when I got it, I gave. Because I know somehow God takes care of us. I can't explain that, and I can't even really tell you how that's going to work for you, you know, in, in times of struggle and stress. But I know this, that my experience in my life has been that God takes care of us. And so I'm going to close this with this, and that is I'm going to ask you two questions. I think one of them is really easy. At least for me it's easy. And hopefully after we just spend a few minutes on this, it'll be easy for you. And that is, the first question is, why was Hannah so generous? She knew God. Here's the hard question. What would it take for you and me to be like Hannah? I think, it's, I think in some ways it's an easy question. We do what Hannah did, right? The, the hard part of it is, how do you live into that? Well, let me just tell you that I think part of it is that it had nothing to do with the two copper coins. But when she was there... She was totally committed to a relationship with who she knew to be God. The God who had brought them out of Egypt. The God who had placed them in the promised land. The God who had taken care of those and had answered every promise throughout history. She trusted that and she was in all are all in as we would say today right she was all in so my prayer today is how can we be like hannah amen